Alex Pollack is a distinguished senior fellow at the R Street Institute. He comes to us with a 35-year banking career and part of it serving as president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago. And he is a published author, a graduate of Princeton University, the University of Chicago, and Williams College. Mr. Pollack, you're now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Waters, members of the committee. Um, Adam, the title of my remarks is an excellent choice. Uh, let me start with this, uh, with this thought. A quote, detailed intrusive regulation is doomed to fail. This is the conclusion, in my view, correct of a prominent expert in bank regulation, and it's true because nobody knows enough about the future to tell other people what to do about it in a, in a detailed way. Surely there's a better way to proceed than promoting unfettered bureaucratic agencies trying to do something at which they're doomed to fail. I believe the Choice Act offers the opportunity of a better way precisely uh, by the fundamental choice it provides. The lack of sufficient capital in banks is a permanent and irresistible temptation to governments to pursue intrusive micro-regulation. Uh, this has an underlying logic to it, after all. In a world in which governments explicitly and implicitly guarantee bank creditors, the government is in fact supplying risk capital to the banks who don't have enough of their own. However, the greater the equity capital of the bank is, the less rationale there is for the detailed regulation. This suggests, indeed, a fundamental and sensible trade-off. More capital, reduced intrusive and onerous regulation. Want to run on less capital? You get the intrusive regulation. Thus, Choice Act offers to banks a very logical decision between two options, which I would characterize like this. Option one, put enough of your equity investors' own money in between your creditors and the risk that other people will have to bail the creditors out if you make mistakes. Mistakes are inevitable when dealing with the future, and this includes mistakes by bankers, by regulators, by central bankers, and by everybody else. The defense is equity capital. Have enough so the government can't claim you are living on the taxpayer's credit and indeed don't be living on the taxpayer's credit. Option two, don't get your equity capital up high enough and instead with, live with the luxuriant regulation of Dodd-Frank as the imposed cost of using the taxpayer's capital instead of your own. I believe the choice thus offered is a truly good idea. Uh, to my substantial surprise, the Washington Post editorial uh, board ag agrees. They write, quote, more promising and more creative is Mr. Henserling's plan to offer relief from some of Dodd-Frank's more onerous oversight provisions for banks that hold at least 10 percent capital. Such a capital cushion can offer as much or more protection against financial instability as intrusive regulations do and do so more simply, unquote, very true. Uh, and very well stated. Of course, we have to answer the question, how much capital ma makes the capital high enough? Uh, to consider the matter first in principle, without doubt, there is some level of capital at which this trade-off makes sense, some level of capital at which everyone would agree that the, the Dodd-Frank burdens become superfluous. But what is the practical level for a rational and realistic trade. My written testimony discusses numerous bank capital proposals, and uh, Adam, I think if you consider that, you'll find that it's not a made-up number, that 10 percent fits into a, a quite elaborate and extensive uh, literature and empirical study uh, of bank capital. Um, of course, we do have to make a judgment because there is no pure market test. Uh, the Choice Act uses, as has been said, the simple and direct measure of tangible leverage capital. This, in my judgment, is superior to the complex and opaque measures of risk-adjusted assets and risk-based capital, uh, and I explain this further in my written testimony. In particular, uh, the risk weightings and risk-based capital are bureaucratic compromises, whereas a real risk is dynamic and changing.
So for purposes of setting up the choice for banks in the proposed act, I believe the simplicity of tangible leverage capital is the right answer. In sum, the Choice Act's proposed choice between option one and option two makes perfect sense, and in my judgment, it ought to be enacted. Thank you for the chance to share these views. Mr. Pollock, I'd like to turn to you now in my remaining time. Uh, same theme, which system can reduce systemic risk more? We've had discussion on risk weighting. Some of our panelists believe that you need a risk weighting. In your testimony, you say, quote, the deepest problem with risk weightings is that they are bureaucratic while risk is dynamic and changing. Designating an asset as low risk is likely to induce flows of increased credit, which end up making it high risk. What was once a good idea becomes a quote, crowded trade, what was once a tail risk becomes instead a highly probable, unhappy outcome. So are you saying risk weightings can actually lead to more systemic risk? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I am saying precisely that. And a good example is the Greek example with zero risk weighting. This was mentioned by several members. I'll just add that the payout of the 2012 restructuring of Greek debt was 25 cents on the dollar, hardly a risk-free outcome. Uh, if we need to uh, uh, curb uh, concentration in the, in the banking industry, uh, this legislation actually repeals the limits on mergers, and uh, including the one that uh, no bank can hold more than 10 percent of the insured deposits in the country. So. Um, if this bill is a, a passed and we're removing these uh, limits, uh, doesn't that encourage consolidation? Uh, I don't agree. I think the most important point of the bill is to make the smaller banks and all banks more competitive, freer, and uh, well capitalized to take away the uh, using the taxpayers' capital. And when those banks are freer and more uh, energetic, uh, they obviously they obviously have a more successful future. You can feel free to answer this. I'm curious, Mr. Pollock, as well. Uh, I, I mean, I was stunned by this notion of uh, it doesn't really matter what the effects of, uh, of, of regulations, a cost-benefit analysis shouldn't uh, be done. Do you care to address that at all? Thanks, Congressman. I think cost-benefit analysis is, is essential um, to any regulatory regime, as is appropriate governance of regulatory bodies and their control uh, by the elected representatives of the people. If I could, Congressman, could I just point out uh, on this question of 10 percent that the International Monetary Fund just recently uh, conducted a large study in which they conclude that 15 to 23 percent risk-based capital would have avoided creditor losses. That doesn't mean bank failures. That means no losses to creditors. In the vast majority of banking crises, they continue this range is consistent with a 9.5 percent total leverage exposure. That is to I'm sorry, say, could you repeat capital. that? I almost thought it almost sounds like the IMF agrees with this committee that it, uh, 10 it does. would be sufficient. Their, their number is 9.5 percent, which I think it would be fair to say is pretty close to 10. Uh, uh, interesting. Okay. Um, well, the, uh, I think fair enough to say that this wasn't uh, plucked out of uh, thin air. Uh, it clearly was uh, debated, uh, has been debated by academics for a long time as well. One of uh, my concerns is, uh, is risk weighting. Is it fair to say with risk weighting that um, through regulation we'll consolidate risk not just in one bank but across the banking sector? Um, which, so mortgage-backed securities, we say they're safe, or today we'll say that um, government uh, debt is safe, causes systemic potential risk throughout the whole banking system, Mr. Pollack. I think that's true, and I think a wonderful example, which we haven't mentioned today, is the risk weighting applied to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac under the U.S. capital standards in which their debt and even their preferred stock were given extremely low capital rate, uh, risk weightings and induced a flow, an excess flow of credit uh, with disastrous results. Well said, and I think diversification across the industry, which is outside then uh, risk weighting, would make a lot of sense to make sure we don't have systemic failures in the future. My time is up. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, Mr. Pollock, do you think that uh, re repeal of Volcker is destabilizing to the financial system? Congressman, uh, I do not. I don't think Volcker had much to do with the crisis and the, the rule didn't have a lot of uh, 
solid rationale in the first place so we can get rid of it. This is my question for Mr. Pollock. Uh, why have the five regulators charged with implementing the Volcker Rule have yet to find any connection between its Volcker Rule and the precipitous uh, drop in bond market liquidity? Well, there's uh, something else they haven't found, Congressman, which, as you said in the beginning, is it's a link between the financial crisis and the, and the uh, things prevented by the Volcker Rule in the first place. Uh, if you're committed to the rule, of course, you don't want to find uh, things that are wrong with it. Uh, it would be a speculation of mine. Okay. Um, has the Volcker Rule, in your opinion, ha had any impact on cost uh, hedging risk? And um, what consequences um, does that have for businesses and other con uh, customers uh, of banks? Uh, I'm, not an, I'm not an expert on this particular uh, topic, Congressman, but I believe that it's true what you say, that whenever you tie up an activity uh, with more and more regulation, you're going to have, uh, you're going to create problems that you didn't mean to create, but you, you've created them anyway. Okay, so if proprietary trading has no good, uh, has no social good or value in creating liquidity and creating markets, why then did, Cong did Congress exempt U United States obligations and those of states and municipalities from proprietary trading? That's a wonderful, a wonderful rhetorical question, Congresswoman. <laughs> and you, uh, you answered yourself in your question. <laughs>